Welcome to another edition of the Bear Report Podcast. The 2024 offseason continues to roll on, and we have a special guest today, second time on the podcast. It's Tyler Dunn of Go Long, and he's been a hot topic of Twitter and Chicago Bears because he put out a fantastic two-part series on a little bit of the history of Chicago Bears quarterbacks. Unfortunately, not a good history, but a very good article and series. Tyler, thanks, man, for joining us tonight. Zach, Aaron, it is a uh, pleasure to be here with you, fellas. Thanks so much for having me. And you're right, the history of the Chicago Bears quarterback. I, I wasn't really sure where to start. Like, you can, you, <laughs> there's so much Cutler stuff on the on oh, the cutting man. room floor that I didn't get into, and I'm sure there's other uh, Cade McNown and you, Rex Grossman. You can go back pretty far with this all, but I fi- figured you'd start there, right? When you you miss on Patrick Mahomes. Yeah, no, it, it's a good topic, especially with the Bears drafting Caleb Williams, hopefully finally getting it right. Um, I guess my first question as we dive into this piece, um, where did this motivation come from? Was it just the Caleb Williams factor? Because, you know, looking at the stuff you've done over the past, I mean, you've, you've done stuff with the Bills, little Packers stuff, um, Eric Kramer, things like that. What, what kind of gave you the motivation to dive into this? Well, I appreciate you reading. Thanks a lot. I no, think no it's, problem. It's always the, the mission of – go log and, and what I've been trying to build since November of 2020 to lift up the curtain uh, on, on the sport, right? Like the fans are the ones investing their sanity and their finances and everything into these games. I mean, you're paying 70 bucks for parking and God knows what for a game ticket and 18 bucks for a beer. And I don't know. I, I just feel like too much is vested into this sport to just get the surface level BS at a podium. You know what I mean? And not to say that all coaches and all players are spewing cliches and sweet nothings, but I feel like there's, you know, the best way to put it, there's a a young assistant coach I was texting with shortly after the draft. And he said, man, everybody on Twitter has no idea how the NFL really works. And I thought that was perfect. There's just so much that happens behind the scenes that never sees the light of day. So I try to hunt down that, that NFL, right? Like it's not always going to be pretty. There's going to be some good, some bad, and some ugly as folks here in Western New York learned in December with Sean McDermott. Um, And and I guess it kind of goes back to green Bay. That was a a big story in the bleach report days, but I I feel like the fans, and this is where I credit bears fans. We were talking before we hit record bears fans are tough. And I feel like they've been so calloused through generations, you know, great grandfathers to grandfathers, the fathers, to sons, like, beaten down by this poor quarterback play. They, they, they want to know. They've got this thirst to know what really happened with each of these quarterbacks in each of these situations. So uh, that was a lot of filibustering. I didn't even answer your question. I suppose it was like t- toward the end of the season, I, you could kind of see this collision course happening that the Carolina Panthers stunk and Frank Wright kind of drove that offense into the ground and, man, hurt some stuff there in Carolina. Very elementary passing game that, and not a lot of talent either. Bad combination. So when it was clear they'd have the number one pick and the Bears would have a shot at Caleb Williams and it was clear that Caleb Williams would be that guy, I just started reaching out to as many people as I could and have conversations and just see where it would lead. Well, and kind of diving more into that, right? Because in, in, I'm sure you follow probably a few Bears riders and you've probably seen some of the craziness that was going on this offseason. But it seemed like everybody outside of Chicago were like, this is not a conversation. Like the Bears are moving on from Justin Fields. The Bears are going to take Caleb Williams. This isn't a conversation. And yet for the better part of, what would you say, Zach, three and a half, four months, because this went well into, oh, yeah. I'd say, halfway through the season, it was mm-hmm. just you were either on one side or the other. Like you were either, you know, Justin Fields is terrible. You've got to get rid of him. No question. It doesn't matter what quarterback they take. Like they're going to take a quarterback or, you know, no matter what, Justin Fields is the guy. He's been screwed, blah, 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 blah. And then – is this is kind of played out a little bit more you're starting to see it's like the bears made the decision very very early on so uh, just from your perspective and what you've learned uh you know when was this decision made and when was this when did this really become a consideration because reading your article the vibe that i got was this is more of like a you know this happened probably in like december sometime yeah i i would i'm not sure exactly when ryan poles matt eberflus knew that they would go the Caleb Williams route. I mean, I think it's important to remember too, like they needed that mini surge. I think it was like November, December to kind of save their jobs. I I don't know how hot their seats were, but it was starting to look a little dicey. And and you can make the case that 
Kevin Warren should have hit reset, should have maybe gotten an offensive mind to pair with Caleb Williams. Let's see how it plays out. I'm, I'm not ready to uh, walk Matt Eberflus down the plank quite yet. Like, I, I don't know if Bill Belichick's winning with Justin Fields. So it probably was when they're winning some games and they, they know they're going to for sure be around to see through this first overall pick. I, I would guess, I mean, that, that'd be my educated guess. It would be then, you know, December, because I don't know what, I mean, this is a quarterback they inherited and they gave him two years. They traded for DJ Moore. They, he had every opportunity with this team to prove that he's the guy. And I, you know what it comes down to? I think it's fatal flaws because I don't want to, it, like Lamar Jackson needed to be in the right system to succeed. They, they were willing to tear everything down and build an offense to take advantage of his skill set. And then they did it again with a different offensive coordinator. So like an athletic quarterback can excel in the NFL. I mean, Cam Newton was his own beast, but I think that fatal flaw of processing the defense is, is real. And if you can't make those quick decisions against man and zone, when a coordinator is making that picture fuzzy and, and, and forcing your eyes to go to a certain place, if you, if you can't make that quick decision, I mean, Allen Robinson, he explained it best. He's been with Blake Bortles, Mitchell Trubisky, Justin Fields, three quarterbacks who didn't have that processing. Then why would you give that quarterback a third year, right? Like, I, I know there are some very loud voices for Justin Fields, and he's been wronged, and it is true. A lame duck regime drafted him. That is not ideal, but I, I don't think he ever would have turned that corner. He told you he, he can't process a defense. I mean, in that press conference, he publicly said, I want to just play my ball. I don't want to be a robot. So I think the Bears, maybe the decision was made then, which uh, it wasn't made then because then they should have traded him after that Washington game, right? That's when they should have traded him. <laughs> when his value would never be higher. Time. <laughs> that would have been it. But I, I think that I'm, I'm sure they couldn't get past that, that, that fatal flaw. And just why, why would you bang your head against the wall when he's not even your guy? He's not your quarterback. Yeah, and, and you know, from an outside perspective looking in, and like I said, you've done a lot of work. You've done work with the Packers, the Bills, um, national stuff. What I mean, what does this look like when you look at, okay, Jay Cutler, Mitch Trubisky, Justin Fields, the guys in between, none of this has worked. Is it – did you feel like, man, this is they're really doing this all wrong? Or what would be like the perspective from the outside looking in? Because we know as Bears fans, it's just it just – never has worked and we're just living quarterback hell but what's kind of your thought process on this whole thing yeah so as you know somebody in that building put he broke it down in the thirds where it's organizational dysfunction letting a lame duck regime draft a quarterback and mortgage a future first round pick that is, that is not normal a, a functioning organization with strong ownership doesn't let that happen a third being just bad evaluation Drafting Mitch Trubisky instead of Patrick Mahomes or Deshaun Watson. I'd probably give that a little bit more than 33.3% myself. Uh, maybe a smidge more. But uh, and, then, and then that third of the market just being different. And I'm telling you, Paris shooting into different places, different cities. It's not like Chicago. Like It's, it's just not. And like we said earlier, I, I think it is the fact that so many generations have lived through the same nonsense. They've seen it. They've gotten their hopes up. They've let themselves believe in a quarterback, and they've seen everything fall apart. The, the, the quarterback position has wasted some really elite defenses, some all-time defenses. I'm just in my lifetime. I'm thinking back to was it like Jim Miller quarterbacking a 13 and three Bears team, and you know Rex Grossman obviously in a Super Bowl. Um, you know even. Jay Cutler on the sideline in the NFC Championship game. There's Caleb Haney. With that, that, the defenses have been elite, and the quarterback play, despite every rule change and everything the NFL does, catering the offense, moving the league toward flag football. We see the kids in the flag football uniforms to begin day two of the NFL draft. That This is where the NFL is going, and yet the Bears still struggle offensively. So I think that has kind of worn the fan base down and, and, and justifiably made – Fans a little ornery, a little pissed off, and that 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 pressure can come down heavy. So I I think it is a combination of of all the above, and you can kind of you know give 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 credence to one more than the other, but it does make it different in Chicago, and I, that's why I just think Caleb Williams was uh, was perfect because it's 
it's it's out of the norm. It, it's not, you're not following any old rules. This is a personality and a player unlike anybody before him. Well, and that's the thing is, and this is how I felt because again, I'm an Oklahoma fan, right? So I've seen I, I've seen Caleb Williams from the very start, and even you know watched a little bit of his you know his high school stuff. It's, it's kind of tough to go back and watch high school. It's like uh, I'll just wait until he gets you know gets to Oklahoma, but. That was kind of the thing with him where it was like, he's just different. And does that guarantee that it's going to work out? No. But one of the things that I found interesting within your two piece article that you did was going and breaking down the Trubisky stuff. And there was a lot of talk and I I know you didn't really touch on it much in the article, but there was a lot of talk um, during his time in Chicago where they basically had to turn off the TVs around him because he was, you know, he's worried about what they were saying and and stuff like that is there was a story. I think it was Dan Weeder on the take the North podcast was talking about how uh, Trubisky's dad came up to the media. um, I think it was right before week one and against green Bay in 2019 and said, he'll be completely fine. If you guys just lay off of him a little bit. And it's like, we're talking about a supposed franchise quarterback. And this is, you know, obviously Trubisky. And you talked a little bit about, you know, the, the struggles there and how Matt Nagy lost faith in him. And then you transitioned to Justin Fields, where Fields is more of the, I don't know if I'd say I, doesn't care type of mentality, but he was much more mentally strong. But then it's like he was seen as this great locker room guy and, you know, it's somebody that everybody gravitated towards. And there were multiple Bears fans that were like, oh, DJ Moore and all these other people are going to, they're going to demand a trade if, if Fields is not on the team this year. And then you start reading through some of your article and it's like, OK, well, you know, the, the Nick Foles thing was obviously interesting. And that was not the first time that that had been talked about. I think uh, Josh Lucas, the Bears old uh, uh, director, player, personnel or whatever he was, uh, has talked about that a few times too. how that whole dynamic, that whole dynamic with him and, and Andy Dalton. And, and that didn't really work out. But I'm just kind of curious from your perspective, like looking at those those prior two quarterbacks and the failures, how do the Bears avoid that for a third time is it just by simply getting the guy uh getting the right guy in the building or is there something more that they need to be able to avoid repeating the same mistake you know and talking to the and talking to the multiple people that you talk to man that that was such a great run down aaron because i think I, i hope that that's what people take away from these stories like it's almost like an autopsy on each of those situations like let's let's take a look at this and and see where everything went very very wrong because I think it's it's too simple to just say, oh, you know, they drafted the wrong guy. Obviously, they drafted the wrong guy when it comes to Patrick Mahomes or Mitch Trubisky. And obviously, it's insane to draft a quarterback, mortgage a future first-round pick when you're going to fire the GM and coach anyways. But I, I think there's just there's so much there to get into. First on Trubisky, that's a really good point because as poisonous as Brad Childress clearly was, I mean, it's, it's kind of nuts that things would just flip in one off season and the coaching staff is, is turning on the quarterback fresh off 12 and four fresh off a division title. You are a double doink away from crushing the Rams in the divisional round. Who knows what happens in NFC championship game. I don't need to tell bears fans, you know, that where, where that, where that counterfactual goes, but for I mean, maybe a product is, is the long off season. You got six, seven months to stew over everything, but children's comes in may and Nagy turns with all of that being said, I, I get the argument that maybe Mitch Trubisky should just be mentally tough enough to overcome it all. And that if he isn't, then he isn't your guy. I, I, I get that for sure. It just seems like needless fighting from within. Um, and then, you know, you mentioned the TVs. Uh, that was interesting. I, I know Dan well, and I'm sure he's done fantastic reporting on this all. That that definitely fits with what I heard in terms of that. Ra- I think I wrote that Raiders game where he didn't play, so he had a chance to reflect. There were people around Trubisky who could kind of tell right then, that early, that he knew something was up. He knew the the coaches were losing some faith in him and that his days might even be numbered, that what, what what's going on here? And I, he wasn't playing well. That Green Bay game was really ugly. Uh, but I, I think that his confidence was shot at that point, and the Bears tried. You know, they had a lot of resources available you know, different mental coaches, like sports psychologists, like a lot of these teams do. Not nothing really worked, and it wasn't until what the end of the next season, uh, with that little mini run, where it was like, oh my gosh, this this quarterback looks pretty darn good. So I, I get it. Like maybe it, I think to answer your question, then like you got to find a quarterback who's who's mentally tough that that can handle whatever's thrown at him. That if you hire a senior offensive assistant and 
he's showing other coaches these test scores and trying to turn people against you that you can just say, screw all that. I'm going to be me and do my thing. Is that Caleb Williams? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I, I had a West Coast scout that has been on him very, very close, telling me this, this guy is tougher than anybody realizes physically, citing that Pac-12 title game when his hamstring felt like an old rubber band, and I think he had a cut on his hand, and he stays in that game as USC is getting blown out. And, and, and mentally, he does think that the fact that he's the first NIL superstar making 10 mil and catching all this backlash on Twitter, means to him, it, meant, it means something, that he could handle that all because he went through it. I mean, <laughs> there's a video of him with lip gloss on, and he took a lot of backlash for that. So there's that, or is this somebody that is going to cry in his mom's arms in front of the country? I, I guess only time will tell how he handles it, but that's definitely something Chicago, I would think, would – be trying to figure out. And then with Fields, yeah, I, I think it's, it's that it's the processing, which we talked about. And, you know, he, he had to improvise a lot. Caleb Williams at USC. I, I, I tend to agree with his coach, Dennis Simmons, who is a straight shooter. He didn't strike me as somebody just blowing smoke and, and trying to hype up his guy that this is somebody, if, if, if it's required of him, that can read a defense from the pocket, pick you apart. And uh, the, the leadership stuff, I'll just say this. I, I, the West Coast scout who's been around Caleb Williams, I relayed what I heard about Justin Fields to him, which, like you, I was surprised to hear it because that's not what we've been told about Justin Fields. And he almost, like, cut me off. He just jumped right in and said, that's not Caleb Williams. Like, he is emotionally intelligent. He does want to have those one-on-one -on -one authentic conversations and relationships with his teammates behind the scenes. It's, it's a, a very real type of leadership that, yeah, it was, it was weird to hear that too, uh, but – and I'm sure there are teammates that love Justin Fields. It's a there's a lot of players in that locker room. They all don't think the same one way or the other. But I did hear the opposite that he really wasn't relatable to uh, a high volume of teammates in there. You know, it, it's interesting the whole Nagy stuff because I was covering the team 2018. It was incredible atmosphere. I mean, so many fun stories you could get with guys. The whole club dub, whether you're a fan or not. What you know, whatever. It was it was fun. 2019, I remember that Raiders game out in London, and Chase Daniel started. And after the game, it felt like a total funeral in that locker room. I mean, it, it felt like someone's mom or dad or, or someone close to them passed away. And, you know, so much going on with that game. Uh, Anthony Miller gets a stupid, stupid penalty, pretty much set the Raiders up for the game-winning drive. Kyle Long um, was pretty much told on the plane ride, like, don't come back to the building or something like that. I think he's told that story out publicly, something along those lines. For, for me, I could kind of feel that Matt Nagy was losing everything, um, and it, it was pretty much over. Do you think Matt Nagy is going to get a head coaching job somewhere else besides Kansas City? Oh, I like how you phrase that. No, I okay. think it will be in Kansas City. Okay. I think he's just going to stay there yeah. until Andy Reid decides to hang him up, and he'll be the head coach. He kind of nestled into that position uh, pretty seamlessly, didn't he? And next thing you know, Eric Bieniemy is out of there, basically fired, told to leave, Get you know, and uh, Matt Nagy's next in, in line. So, yeah, you know, that was uh, a point that Allen Robinson really wanted to make. He probably brought that up three or four different times, whether it was 2019 or 2020, both years, his big regret is that he didn't just like pull Matt Nagy aside and say, look, stick with your system, stick with what you believe. E even in 19, stick with the quarterback. Like there, there is some good here that we can build on where we're starting to understand what you want out of us it went down to the granular level of Mitch Trubisky scene now, a quarterback's playing you this way, Alan. I'm going to – let's do this little signal and, and run the fade. So uh, I, I, I think that I, – would, would anything have really changed? I, I, don't, I don't know. But it wouldn't have been as chaotic, right? It wouldn't have been – because 2020 was a total mess. I mean, he said as early as training camp, they're at the line of scrimmage, and, and Nick Foles is trying to run the KC West Coast stuff. Everybody else is running the Nagy off – I'm sorry, the, the Bill Lazor offense, and nobody's on the same page, and nobody knows who's, who's calling plays, and it was just a mess, like an, another needless mess. of, of and, it, and it started early that previous offseason, right? You bring in a coordinator who, in theory, will get the most out of Trubisky, and then 
you give Nagy the quarterback he wants in Nick Foles. I believe that's COVID. So who even knows how close these people are face-to-face to discuss this stuff. And it, it just kind of reached a new realm of chaos, which the Bears have been familiar with. Yeah, and it's it, my bigger question with the whole Nagy thing is not does he get another job or whatever, but it's like has he matured enough? Because it's like people talk about maturing, but we're talking about a guy that was what thirty eight when he took the job. It's not like we're talking about you know a, a twenty year old draft prospect. The way that he handled a lot of things that you detailed and other people have detailed about the Bears and and the whole situation was extremely poor i mean you could and zach could speak to this better than anybody because he was in the media room and, and saw him quite a bit i mean the way that he aged from 2019 to the the point when he was fired after the 2021 season i mean he didn't even look like the same person he put on weight it just he just looked miserable so i think that's my bigger question is it's like he was fun you know the club dub thing was great when they were winning football games but then when they stopped winning football games and things got tough is when it was like, you know, the ego with the the play calling. Um, it, frankly, I think he was a terrible play caller. And that's coming from, you know, just watching Luke Getze over the last few years. But I, that's what I'm most curious about because it's like, hmm. yeah, you can, you can put him in Kansas City with Patrick Mahomes and that's going to cover up some warts. But at a certain time, like if he's not the leader, if he's the same leader that he was in Chicago, I don't know how that's going to work over time. Right, and, and there were moments this past season with the Kansas City Chiefs where you're wondering, man, is that a naggy influence? Is, is, is that why this offense doesn't look like it did in years past? And, and, and that's the only change that you really saw in that coaching staff and that roster was Matt Nagy was having more power and, and, and how that stuff was run. But you're, I think it's the interpersonal connections that matter most. I mean, being a head coach of a football team is is so much more than calling plays and installing an offense. And I mean, to, to not even show up when Mitch Trubisky wants to just sit down and talk things through. It's nuts. It's crazy. Even if, even if you have swiped left on the quarterback and you're done with him, you, you kind of owe it to him to at least have a conversation, like hear it out. It just, he was, and I'm not going to sit here and say that the bears are perennial, NFC North champions with with Mitchell Trubisky at quarterback by any means, but it, it just there was no effort to really try to make it work right out of a twelve and four season, which it's bizarre to me. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, go ahead, Aaron. Sorry. Well, I, I want to. So, I do you have anything else non Caleb related, Zach? Because I've got a. I don't know if I'd say a bone to pick. No, I am curious on. <laughs> I'm curious on something that one of your one of your sources said, uh, and I thought it was really interesting. Where he basically said that he's he's essentially allergic to throwing deep to his right in the pocket. And it's funny because I have I have a, uh, a buddy in one of our group chats that is a giant numbers guy. Um, his name is Stark Kyle Orton. Um, I just kind of wanted to shout him out because he he provided a lot of numbers, and it was actually pretty interesting. And, and keep in mind, you know, a lot of these numbers are. It's not just from when he's playing in structure, you know, a breakout or whatever. But in terms of his like his deep left versus his deep right, in terms of career percentage, like his deep left was six and a half percent, and his deep right was seven seven point four. And what I found interesting though, and this is something that I, I've noticed, you know, in, in the people that you talk to, and then just listening to other former scouts, former general managers. Like there seems to be this weird perception with Caleb Williams that I cannot quite understand where it's like he creates all this chaos. And I'm not I'm not debating that his time to throw was crazy high, um, you know, playing in structure is something that he needs to improve on. But it's like when you look at how much he threw when he broke the pocket and then you have the same people that are praising Jaden Daniels when the guy scrambled out of the pocket and out and basically took off running more than any other quarterback in NCAA uh, last year. Uh, with a clean pocket. So I'm, I'm just, I'm curious, it, it, like I said, it's not so much of a bone to pick, but I'm curious, like just for more context on some of the thoughts behind the, you know, allergic to throwing right and the, you know, breaking the pocket and creating chaos and all, and, you know, all the, some of the narratives that, again, I'm a huge Caleb Williams fan and I have no problem admitting that, not just because he's, you know, a bear or whatever. I've, I've been a big fan of him since he was with Oklahoma, but it feels like, people have continued to build uh, Jaden Daniels into this quarterback prospect that he's not. And then 
all of the issues that Jaden Daniels has is somehow projected on the Caleb Williams. And I'm kind of curious from your perspective, because I'm sure the comparisons between the two or, you know, even with Drake May, because I think you're a Drake May quarterback one guy, right? Me? Yeah. I thought you, I, I thought you were. Cause I, thought I, I like him. I, I definitely like him more than most, but I would go Caleb Williams for sure. Okay, see, I thought for some yeah. odd reason, and maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Cause you, you have your. I was. I, your I couldn't get. I couldn't get there with Eric Kramer. I couldn't. I couldn't go to that. That link. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's fair. No, and I. Dude, Drake May was my number two, and Zach's a huge North Carolina fan, so I know he loves May as well. But it was it's still. It, it's just. It's. It's interesting to to hear. Obviously, everybody's got their different evaluations, but when you actually look at the numbers between some of these quarterbacks, and it's like really Jaden Daniels, and I'm just. I'm looking at my phone. It's like. His his deep throw percentage in terms of deep left and deep deep right were more skewed than Caleb Williams. So I, I'm just I'm curious the overall yeah. tone on some of that, um, it, j- just from a playing standpoint, because I know like the the nails were brought up and the the lip gloss and everything else, and I know that's a touchy subject for a lot of people. I don't really want to get into any of that, but from a play perspective, what was the overall narrative? Uh, you know, what was the overall feeling behind it all? Um, you know, just outside of what you know, just what you shared in the articles. Yeah, I think because that's that's the question with Caleb Williams. When you watch all of this magic and and for these stories, I, I went back and watched not just highlights but full games, and you can't get enough. You don't want to stop. He is so fun to watch. He's so entertaining. Uh, I, I don't even know who comes close. Like you know, Vin, Vince Young in the Rose Bowl, Johnny Manziel against Alabama. It, it, it is that kind of stuff. But I think the person who broke down that in his mind quirk in his game and tendency to throw to certain parts of the field. He he was nitpicking and trying to take this electric entertaining player and put him in, in, in the NFL world because it is different in the NFL world. You, you can't make your living playing the way he played. So when he's playing with that style, is that, is that because he had to? I mean, the line wasn't very good last year. His 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 team in twenty twenty three was not the team that he had in twenty twenty two when he won the Heisman, or, or was he masking some inability to to process? You know, the stuff that held Trubisky back and Fields back, and I think the Bears they've been trying to answer this question themselves with Caleb Williams, and obviously got to a place where they were comfortable drafting him and making them their their franchise quarterback. So. I don't. I I tend to agree with you, Aaron. Like I I think it was just necessity. I mean, this was. I think the comparison I used. It's it's Allen Iverson throwing the 01 Sixers on his back because he's playing with freaking Eric Snow and Matt Geiger and Todd McCullough. It's like it's 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 not the same U.S. Yeah, no defense, by the way. I mean, every game's going to be a shootout. So I, I think it's more of that. And if he was asked to scan the whole field, make all the reads and win from the pocket, play a boring style of football. He, he can do that. I mean, Dennis Simmons, the passing game coordinator, assistant head coach, I mean, he was pretty adamant. Like, he'll do whatever it takes to win, whether it's dinking and dunking or being Mr. Improvisational. So I, I'm i with you. I, I, I think that, that that is in his game, and it has to be in his game. And the Bears and their coaches, led by Shane Waldron on the offensive side of the ball, they have to kind of build the infrastructure for him so he doesn't get, get baited into – escaping the pocket and breaking the pocket sooner than he should. Uh, you know, Brett Favre has said this multiple times. We've had him on our podcast where it's like, you know, he, if without Mike Holmgren, who the hell knows where his career goes? Because A, he didn't even know what a nickel defense was, but he, he's just running all over the place, throwing it all over the place, not much structure. He, he needed Mike Holmgren calling plays that kind of steered him out of trouble. So I think that's going to help Caleb Williams. I mean, Warren Moon put it really well. Just give him a one-two option. Keep it simple. That's what Bobby Sloak did with C.J. Stroud in Houston. And then when you want that specialist to come out, two-minute drill, third down, whatever, you can kind of tap into that. I mean, Patrick Mahomes was a game manager last postseason, right? I mean, he, he won from the pocket for the most part, and he'd take off running like all of our three-year-olds with a remote control in the basement when he had to. <laughs> but I, I think that Caleb Williams is – I think he gets it. And you know what? Like That pro day – it showed so much self-awareness out of him to just have this boring ass pro day where he's really not doing anything fun, right? This isn't uh, Kyle Bowler throwing from one knee or Zach Wilson or Jane. You know, he's just 
Dinkin and Duncan and proving the teams, look, I, I can do this kind of stuff. So, and oh, by the way, yeah, like he doesn't have Andy Reid as his coach coming in and he doesn't have Alex Smith to sit behind, but he's got way more talent around him than really any first overall pick ever, at least in my lifetime. I, I can't think of anything that comes close. Yeah, I think the only thing that would be questionable would be the offensive line, but from a skill position, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's That's true. I'm trying to think, somebody, man, and I, I'm drawing a blank now, somebody actually did like a really long-winded comparison from like an analytical standpoint. It was really interesting because he wasn't like, he didn't have the best situation in total out of everything, like, like sorry, individually, but when he total everything up, it was like, okay, yeah, this is a really, really good situation. So while Zach is asking, Probably his last question. I got to go grab something because you sent me this a while ago and I got to show you that I have it oh. still. So I will be right back. <laughs> yeah, my, my last one is an easy one. And I kind of want you to promote the story a little bit because I, I do think everyone should go subscribe and read it. It's fantastic. Two parts. What is what was like the most shocking thing you learned um, or most like or thing that kind of made you like raise your eyes or like kind of you know perk your ears up a little bit without like fully giving it away in the story like what would you pitch to a reader um that would you be like okay go go do this now oh man i appreciate that question no yes, definitely everybody <laughs> subscribe go log td.com uh it's just eight bucks a month 50 for the year always trying to do these long form stories across the league and it's it's so encouraging that people kind of want to take their brains back because we're all just you know on social media, scrolling away, uh, busy with all of our lives. But yep. like a week like this has given me so much hope for humanity that people want to hit pause and read something for a half hour. And I, I just can't thank everybody enough for reading and subscribing. I, you know, there were a lot of wow moments in both parts. Probably the the I mean the the injection of of a Brad Childress. I mean that that okay. that still is kind of baffling and to hear how one coach could change the opinions of many people behind the scenes over the off season was was fairly shocking you know i i just think like you know the off season we don't have football games for so long the nfl is creating drama i mean today is schedule release day and i mean we've we've known who all of these teams are playing and everybody's losing their mind i mean nobody creates drama like the nfl and uh <laughs> When you know, for the longest time, I've kind of assumed. Well, I mean, what the hell is really happening in uh, in, in meetings in February, and March, or workouts in April, and and OTAs? I mean, what, what's I mean, so many players just blow off OTAs, right? Yeah. But that that children stuff proved to me like there are tectonic changes to organizations this time of year that maybe we just don't even really know about. Yeah, that's good. That's that's what I would have brought up too. Yeah. Thank you. Well, Tyler, you were awesome. So I had to go grab this. Hey. Yes. yes. So this book was awesome. And, and, and I know, so it's kind of one of those things because I feel like Bears fans, especially with as bad as they've been and, you know, the national media, the, you know, a lot of people viewed them as, you know, national media attacking them. The reality of it is, man, the Bears have been bad for a while. Um, so I, I feel like sometimes people tend to shut out the outside world that, you know, the national stories and, you know, I've subscribed to you for a while. I love, love all the stuff you do. Uh, Bob McGinn doing all of his, uh, you know, his, his pre-draft work, his scouting stuff. It's, it's funny because like, it's, you get like Dane Brugler does a fantastic job, right? Like he does, the beast is amazing. You can get a lot of good scouting reports, but then you get Bob again and it's like, you just some of the stuff that he is able to get out of these scouts and former scouts, the, the amount of information that comes from it is, is awesome. Plus you have an awesome podcast. Like I was listening the other day cause I kind of wanted to hear you go a little deeper and it's really cool to listen to not only you, but having somebody with that front office uh, experience and kind of going through the evaluation process and just kind of the overall thought process behind what it is like, like you talked about before, it's like, you know, a lot of people don't have any idea how an NFL team is run. Like it's all fantasy. We're all sitting here on Twitter. We're all talking. We're all making this conversation thinking we know what we're talking about. But in reality, there's very few people who are ever going to be able to do the job. 
And the fact that you have somebody on your podcast that can go in depth and, <laughs> and, and kind of explain their point of view without this, this crazy bias one way or another, I think is awesome. So this is a really long way of saying I've been a giant fan of you for a long time. Um, you've done great work. I mean, even when you were doing stuff with the Bleacher Report, like you just always had these amazing, like you said, long form stories. And but it's it's so much like what you offer um, go long is so much more than that. There's so much more perspective with the podcast, with what you know, the other things that you feature. It's like eight dollars a month isn't anything, especially if you do the fifty dollars a year. I mean, let's just put it this way. I subscribe to a lot of things and this is one of one of my favorites. And that's not just saying it because you came on like you. You are an amazing journalist. You tell amazing stories. The book was amazing. Like you always <laughs> provide a different perspective um, than than a lot of people would even think to have. You want to keep going? I'm saying, <laughs> thank you so much, Aaron. Absolutely. My God, Absolutely. that was uh, that was unbelievable. Uh, th thank you so much for subscribing.